Hello, I'm David Farzam. Welcome to New Cancer Mentality. Today, this is going to be part one of a three-part series with Dr. Arnold Glazer. The title of this series is Cancer in the Postgenomic Era. Where do we go from here? What will it take to prevent, cure, or control cancer? An ambitious plan to sequence the DNA of human cancers was started about five years ago by the National Institute of Health, John Hopkins, the Sanger Institute, and other research groups. The DNA from many different types of human cancers has now been sequenced. The results are very clear. Every patient's cancer is different. Dr. Bert Vogelstein at John Hopkins led a team that sequenced the DNA in breast, colon, brain, and pancreatic cancers. I now read two separate quotes from Dr. Vogelstein. Each cancer in each patient is different from any other cancer in any other patient. That's both mind-boggling and challenging. It is apparent from studies like ours that it is going to be even more difficult than expected to derive real cures. Dr. Matthew Ellis from Washington University in St. Louis led a team that recently sequenced the DNA of 50 breast cancers, and I now quote Dr. Ellis. The results are complex and somewhat alarming because the problem does not make you sit down and rethink what breast cancer truly is. So, where do we go from here? How can we cure or control cancer when every patient has a different disease with different genetic alterations? How can we deal with the gen genetic complexity of cancer? These questions will be the focus of the major focus of this series of webcasts. The geneticist Dobshansky stated, nothing in biology makes sense in the light of evolution. Dr. Glazer will discuss cancer in the light of evolution. This seems especially appropriate given the widespread agreement within the scientific community that cancer itself is an evolutionary process. What, he, what you will hear is a new way of thinking about cancer that radically redefines the problem by challenging some of the most deeply embedded assumptions that form the very foundation in modern cancer research. Assumptions which Dr. Glazer contends are logically inconsistent with the evolutionary nature of cancer and contradicted by a large body of scientific evidence. In part one, Dr. Glazer will review the evidence that cancer is an enormously diverse, unpredictable evolutionary process and discuss the logical and practical implications. In part two, he will examine what is required to prevent and reduce the risk of developing cancer. In part three, Dr. Glazer will discuss requirements for the cure or control of cancer and propose practical ways to bypass the staggering genetic complexity of the, of the disease and specifically cure or control of metastatic cancer. He will also talk about a proposed approach for the treatment and, and cure of brain cancer. Dr. Glazer graduated from Boston University's six-year medical program. He trained in pediatrics at John Hopkins Hospital and Tufts New England Medical Center and was a research fellow in oncology at John Hopkins Oncology Center. His primary research focus is in the field of anti-cancer drug design and development. Dr. Glazer is the author of the book Cure, Scientific, Social, and Organizational Requirements for the Specific Cure of Cancer. He was also the co-organizer of a 2007 Manandel Institute workshop titled Requirements for the Cure of Cancer, Formulating a Plan of Action, which brought together leading scientists and clinicians from the National Cancer Institute, academia, and industry to rethink cancer. I trust that you will find these webcasts both interesting, informative, and important. Let's now begin part one of the three-part series. Dr. Glazer, it's a pleasure to have you on the New Cancer Mentality webcast today. Thank you. I think it is terrific that you've set up the New Cancer Mentality website. The name is very appropriate. We need a new way of thinking about cancer. As currently formulated, the problem of cancer is unsolvable. So Dr. Glazer, what is cancer and why has it been proven to be so difficult to prevent and cure or control? There are trillions of cells in the human body. The cells are continuously dying and being replaced by new cells. Normally this process is very tightly regulated. One cell dies and one cell arises to take its place. In cancer, this order and control breaks down. The rate of new cell formation exceeds the rate of cell death. The result is the formation of an abnormal mass of cells, or tumor, which can be benign or cancerous. 
benign tumor cells proliferate and compress adjacent tissue. By contrast, cancer cells proliferate and invade into surrounding tissues and can spread to distant sites in the body. As a practical matter, cancer is defined by malignant behavior, which is cell proliferation and invasiveness in an abnormal context or setting in the body. While the definition of cancer is simple, the disease is not. Cancer is an enormously complex, unpredictable evolutionary process characterized by nearly unlimited genetic and epigenetic diversity that occurs within the body. Here's the problem. A patient with metastatic cancer can have a trillion cancer cells spread throughout his or her body. Each cancer cell is generally unique with different genetic and epigenetic alterations. It is generally not possible to examine all the cancer cells in a patient and the picture keeps changing. New cancer cells are constantly evolving. We cannot predict what will evolve and a single cancer cell, one cell that evades therapy could cause progressive disease. And do you think metastatic cancer can be cured? Yes. High cure rates have been achieved with multiple drug combination th chemotherapy for a number of types of cancer, including childhood leukemia, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and testicular cancer, albeit with significant toxicity and side effects. Unfortunately, it hasn't been possible to extend the success of multiple drug combination combination chemotherapy to most common types of cancer. In 2010, over 569,000 people died in the United States from cancer. Worldwide, the toll was nearly 8 million people. The problem with conventional chemotherapy is that drugs lack specificity. The drugs are almost equally toxic for cancer cells and normal cells. The quest for tumor specificity has led to an intensive 50-year effort to discover and understand the molecular alterations of cancer cells and to develop drugs and therapies that can specifically kill or control cancer cells. In your introduction, you said that as currently formulated, the problem of cancer is unsolvable. Why do you uh, say this? Cancer cells are not the problem. The problem is an evolutionary population of cancer cells. Cancer is first and foremost about the growth of an evolutionary population of cancer cells. And the importance of the word evolutionary population cannot be overemphasized. There's a big difference between the properties of cancer cells and those of an evolutionary population of cancer cells. The failure to recognize and fully accept this difference has caused the problem of cancer to be inadequately defined and frustrated attempts to cure or control the disease. We need, and we'll discuss, a higher level of theory based not on the properties of cancer cells, but based on the properties of the set of all cancer cells that could evolve in a patient. Exactly what problem needs to be solved to cure or control cancer? The problem that needs to be solved is this. The comprehensive detection and destruction or control of an enormously diverse, unpredictable, evolving population of cancer cells in a patient. That's what cancer is and that's what needs to be addressed to cure or control the disease. Is this a solvable problem? Yes, there are good reasons to believe that cancer can be cured and without significant toxicity to the patient. However, there are certain requirements that must be satisfied for the consistent cure or control of cancer, which we will talk about in part three of this series of webcasts. These requirements principally relate to the information needed to detect and destroy an evolutionary population of malignant cells in a patient. These requirements sharply define a practical pathway to the cure or control of all types of solid metastatic cancers. However, unless these requirements are satisfied, the consistent cure or control of cancer is essentially impossible. Can current approaches to the development of therapy for the cure or control of cancer meet these requirements? No. We're getting ahead of ourselves now, but let me state the bottom line. The foundation of modern research is based upon the premise that therapy should depend 
upon the particular evolutionary pathways, the particular genetic and epigenetic alterations present in a patient's cancer. However, the unpredictable evolutionary nature of cancer implies that the opposite is true. The essential features of any therapy for the cure or control of cancer must be independent of the pathways of tumor cell evolution and independent of the particular genetic and epigenetic alterations present in a patient's cancer. Therapeutic approaches that are dependent upon the pathways of tumor cell evolution have not and cannot provide a basis for the consistent cure or control of cancer. An open and intellectually honest debate about this very fundamental question is long overdue. Would it be helpful to begin with an overview of evolution and evolutionary processes? Yes, I think so. Evolutionary processes arise when four conditions coexist. The necessary and sufficient conditions for evolution are random variation, reproduction, heredity or transmission of variation to offspring, and selective pressure, which results in competition for survival. Random variations that confer a reproductive or survival advantage are naturally selected for and become enriched in the population. New random variations arise and the process repeats. The cumulative effect of a very large number of these selection cycles generated the complex machinery of life. Runaway evolution inside the body results in cancer. Does evolution always occur in the body? Is it somewhat inevitable? Yes. Given sufficient time, evolution will occur. The necessary and sufficient conditions for evolution are present in the body. Random variations occur. We're constantly bombarded with agents that damage DNA. Oxygen alone is estimated to cause approximately 10,000 mutations per cell per day. Most are repaired. However, the mechanisms of DNA repair and replication are not perfect. Reproduction, or in other words, cell proliferation, occurs. Heredity is hardwired into the cells. And selective pressure is inevitable. Resources vital to cell growth and cell survival are finite. What role do carcinogens, like cigarette smoke, play in causing cancer? Most, but not all, agents that cause cancer damage DNA, increase genetic variation, and thereby accelerate the rate of evolution within the body. This explains the long lag time between the exposure to carcinogens and the development of cancer. It often takes years to decades for cancer to develop after exposure to carcinogens. Other factors increase the risk of developing cancer by increasing cell proliferation and thereby accelerating evolution inside the body. A prime example is the increased risk of breast cancer caused by estrogen replacement in postmenopausal women. In general terms, how does evolution give rise to cancer in the body? Genetic and epigenetic alterations arise that confer a growth or survival advantage to cells. The fittest, most aggressive cells survive and pass on to the next generation information helpful for cell survival and reproduction. Repetitive cycles of this process of random mutation and natural selection can lead to cancer. Continuation of the process generates a constantly changing population of increasingly aggressive cancer cells that can evade therapy and cause progressive disease. As discussed by Dr. Carlo Malley in a previous webcast, the evolutionary origins of cancer trace back about 600 million years to the emergence of multicellular organisms from single cell organisms. Tumor suppressor genes evolved over millions of years to constrain and control single cell proliferation in multicellular organisms. A major mechanism that contributes to the evolution of cancer is the loss or inactivation of tumor suppression genes that function to restrain evolution within cell populations in the body. Does evolution in the body always lead to cancer? No. Both in humans and in animals, the vast majority of evolutionary cell populations do not progress to cancer. In animals exposed to carcinogens, 
most seemingly precancerous evolutionary lesions, often up to 95%, never progress to cancer. A Barrett's esophagus is a good example of an evolutionary process inside humans. Over 10 years, about 5% of patients with Barrett's esophagus will develop esophageal cancer. 95% will not. In fact, even when cancer has evolved, a significant percent will regress and never, never cause clinical disease. For example, over 50% of the cases of, childhood, of the childhood cancer neuroblastoma that are detected by cancer screening will regress or disappear without treatment and never cause disease. So what determines if and when evolution within the body will result in cancer? It's totally unpredictable. The underlying genetic and epigenetic alterations are generally random. Cancer develops when genetic and epigenetic alterations increase the probability of cell survival per cell division. Let me explain. Normally, the probability of cell survival is 0.5 per cell division. The probability of cell survival equals that of cell death, and the cell population size remains relatively constant. Now here's the remarkable thing. Over time, for example, 100 cell cycles, very minor sustained changes in the probability of cell survival translate into truly enormous changes in the cell population size. This is due solely to statistical and mathematical factors. Dr. William Moore from Johns Hopkins and Dr. Jules Berman from the University of Maryland published on this topic 20 years ago. A 10% increase in the probability of cell survival going from 0.5 to 0.55 would result in an extremely aggressive cancer. In most human cancers, the probability of cancer cell survival was increased by about 2%. 2%, that's a very subtle change. The good news is that to control cancer, we just need to decrease the probability of cancer cell survival by a small amount over a sustained period of time. The bad news is that a large number of different combinations of genetic and epigenetic alterations can result in such a minor increase in cell survival probability and produce cancer. To quote a paper on cancer genome sequencing by Dr. Vogelstein and his colleagues, the data are consistent with the idea that large numbers of mutations, each associated with a small fitness advantage, drive tumor progression. Not surprisingly, as previously mentioned, gene sequencing studies in human cancers indicate that every patient's cancer is unique at the DNA level. What kinds of genetic and epigenetic changes occur inside the body and why are they so important in causing cancer? All types. It's total chaos. Alterations can and do occur at all genetic and epigenetic levels and in virtually all combinations. Entire chromosomes can be lost or gained. Pieces of chromosomes can be lost, gained, or shuffled between other chromosomes or within chromosomes. Pieces of DNA can be lost, gained, amplified, or moved to other locations. Fusion genes can be created. The base sequence of DNA can be altered. DNA bases can be added or deleted. Cells can have multiple nuclei. Cancer cells can fuse with normal cells and regain lost genes. And epigenetic changes can turn on or turn off gene expression. And these genetic and epigenetic changes have profound biological consequences, resulting from the loss of normal regulatory controls, the emergence of new gene products with novel functions, the switching on and off of existing genes and gene expression networks, the creation of new gene expression networks, the loss of cellular machinery required for DNA repair, which leads to genetic instability, the loss of machinery required for apoptosis or programmed cell death, the loss of genes and their products, and the amplification of gene products. And the changes can occur in a nearly endless number of different combinations. Do the particular combinations of genetic and epigenetic alterations matter? Yes, and this is an ex another extremely important point. 
the biological significance of particular genetic and ep or epigenetic alterations depend upon what other alterations are present. Individual DNA base pairs are like symbols or letters of the alphabet. By themselves, they have no meaning. The information conveyed depends upon the context. In cancer cells, not only do the symbols change, but the context also changes. Let me give you an example. Consider an epigenetic alteration at site A that shuts off the adjacent gene B. The biological consequences of that epigenetic change could be completely different if a second alteration shuffled the DNA and replaced gene B with, say, gene C. The effect of anti-cancer drugs that target genetic alterations can also depend upon the context. For example, the drug PLX4032 inhibits the growth of melanoma cells that have a particular BRAF mutation. The very same drug increases the growth of melanoma cells that lack the BRAF mutation. The context is key. Are the biological consequences of genetic and epigenetic alterations in cancer cells generally predictable? No. The consequences of genetic and epigenetic alterations in cancer cells can be unpredictable. We are dealing with a complex, nonlinear system with multiple positive and negative feedbacks. There are multiple interacting parts. A seemingly minor change can trigger an avalanche of biochemical changes at multiple scales in the cancer cell, in adjacent cancer cells, in the microenvironment, and systemically in the patient. What are some of the consequences of tumor cell evolution? The list is very long. Consequences of tumor cell evolution include emergence of cancer cells with novel mechanisms of malignant transformation, increasingly aggressive behavior, enhanced ability to metastasize, uh, the ability to evade the immune system, the loss of tumor antigens, the, the ability to evade apoptosis or programmed cell death, resistance to anti-cancer drugs, the ability to preferentially grow in different sites of the body, uh, hormone and growth factor independence, the, the ability to stimulate new blood vessel formation, the ability to recruit normal cells to promote tissue invasion, and increase genetic and epigenetic instability. Cancer cells can even evolve that grow better in the presence of certain anti-cancer drugs. The net result of tumor cell evolution is to promote proliferation and survival of cancer cells in response to changing selective pressures and environmental conditions. Can we understand cancer? That's an enormously important question. No. We may be able to understand particular cancer cells. However, cancer is not about any particular cancer cells. Cancer is about an enormously diverse, unpredictable, evolving population of cancer cells. Tumor cell evolution implies that cancer is not about any particular tumor cell type, type of cancer stem cell antigen, genetic or epigenetic alteration, oncogene or cancer-causing gene, metabolic abnormality, mechanism of tumor vascularization or angiogenesis, mechanism of malignant transformation or pathway of tumor cell evolution. Virtually any genetically encoded molecular property or target can be deleted, modified, or lost to detection by mutations during tumor cell evolution. It is the exceptions that disprove theories and result in cancer cells that evade therapy and cause progressive disease. This is an inconvenient truth, but one that must be recognized, accepted, and addressed in order to cure or control cancer. Just as a point of clarification, is angiogenesis or new blood vessel formation required for cancer to occur? No. It is usually present, but not required. A blood supply is generally required, not angiogenesis. 
Cancer cells can and do gain access to a blood supply by a variety of mechanisms that do not involve new blood vessel formation. One way is by invading along existing blood vessels, a process Dr. Folkman called vascular co-option. In one study, 96% of human breast cancer lesions in the liver were found to use vascular co-option, not angiogenesis, to se secure blood supply. How about cancer stem cells? The, the cancer stem cell theory asserts that a rare subpopulation of tumor cells with well-defined stem cell characteristics are responsible for tumor growth and sustaining the disease of cancer. Even though there is considerable evidence to support this theory, that's not what matters. The theory is contradicted by a massive amount of scientific evidence that demonstrates tumor cell evolution. Cancer stem cells, or whatever you want to call them, evolve and change. Furthermore, in human melanomas, one out of every four tumor cells was able to give rise to tumors when transplanted into animals. One out of four cells is hardly rare. And in some animal models, the frequency of cancer cells that can give rise to tumors is even higher and approaches 100%. I'd like to make a very important point. Cancer is a disease of statistical extremes and outliers, of black swans. One cell out of billions can profoundly influence the clinical course of cancer. A single cancer cell that is resistant to therapy can potentially give rise to progressive metastatic disease. The question is not, are there cancer cells in the patient that have a particular genetic alteration? But rather, are there cancer cells in the patient that lack the particular genetic lesion? Given billions of cancer cells in a patient, it is highly probable that some cells will evolve that lack the genetic alteration or which are resistant to therapy that targets it. It is the exceptions that disprove theories, cause treatment failures, and result in progressive cancer. Cancer is a disease of extreme exceptions, of black swans. So how many different types of cancer cells could potentially evolve? A cancer cell could be described by the combination of genetic and epigenetic changes present in the cell. For practical purposes, the number of different types of cancer cells that could evolve is nearly unlimited. The exact number is unknown and unknowable. Based on measured mutation rates, the number is at least 10 to the 68,000th power. That's the number one followed by 68,000 zeros. That's a lot of black swans. It's hard to image a number as big as 10 to the 68,000th power. Could you help put that number into perspective for our audience? Sure. Let's consider a much smaller number, 10 to the 40th power. If you had a stack of 10 to the 40 pennies, it would take over a trillion years for a light at the end of the stack to reach your eyes. That's for 10 to the 40th power. For cancer, we're talking over 10 to the 68,000th power different possible genotypes. In a human cancer cell, there are about 6 billion base pairs of DNA. Can the change of a single DNA base mutation be important in causing cancer? Uh, I wouldn't say it would be important in causing cancer, but I would say that it can be enormously important from a clinical point of view. Uh, single point mutations have been shown to confer resistance to many anti-cancer drugs, although most point mutations will be inconsequential. So even the most minor of genetic changes can have profound clinical implications. One drug resistant cancer cell after 40 cell doublings can give rise to one trillion cancer cells and result in lethal disease. Dr. Larry Loeb at the University of Washington in Seattle discovered that human cancer cells frequently have a mutator phenotype. Can you talk about the implications of Dr. Loeb's work? Extremely important. Human cancer cells exhibit mutation rates 
that can be hundreds of times higher than in normal cells. Based on the observed mutation rates, every cancer cell is estimated to have 10,000 unique mutations, and a pea-sized tumor would have, have approximately one trillion different mutations. So not only is every patient's cancer unique, but every cancer cell in a patient is also generally unique. Is it possible to predict the pathways of tumor cell evolution? No. Tumor cell evolution is a hugely diverse, unpredictable, stochastic process. To predict the course or pathway of tumor cell evolution would require predicting the genetic and epigenetic alterations that will arise in each and every cancer cell at future points in time in the patient. As I noted earlier, the number of evolutionary pathways is nearly unlimited, at least 10 to the 68,000th power. Most genetic alterations arise from events or processes that are stochastic or random. Furthermore, multiple stochastic processes are involved in natural selection and influence which cancer cells will survive. What do you mean by stochastic? Uh, random, but a, a certain kind of randomness. A stochastic process is a type of random process in which the probability of particular outcomes can vary in time and depend upon prior stochastic events. Now you may notice circularity in my definition. I used the word stochastic to define the word stochastic. I did this purposefully to underscore that the type of randomness in stochastic processes often has a recursive nature where the output of one random step becomes the input for the next random step. Stochastic processes often have a branching type structure of possible outcomes. Could you give me some examples? Sure. The, the roll of dice is random, but not stochastic, because the probabilities of a particular number coming up, two for example, are fixed. By contrast, Brownian motion, uh, the motion of a particle of pollen, is stochastic. The pathways of individual gas molecules in air are stochastic. Evolution is a stochastic process. Is evolution random? The word random is too coarse and imprecise a term to accurately describe evolution. Evolution is stochastic but follows a rule. I like the way that Richard Dawkins expresses the non-randomness of evolution. Of all the wolves that might survive, a non-random sample, the fleetest of foot, the canniest of wit, the sharpest of sense and tooth, are the ones that do survive and pass on their genes. The same holds true for tumor cell evolution, the rule of survival of the fittest cancer cells. Nonetheless, the universe of all possible types of cancer cells that could evolve is nearly unlimited, and what will evolve at least at the genetic and epigenetic level, is unpredictable. The problem is not just the sheer diversity of random genetic variation. Natural selection is also an incredibly diverse stochastic process. The selective pressures that influence tumor cell survival and replication depend upon the properties of the cell and the environment. Cell survival involves multiple complex interacting stochastic and non-stochastic processes. The genetic makeup of the cell and of all other cells in competition for survival, the location of the cell, the immune response, drugs, nutrients, hormones, oxygen, and many, many other factors. In addition, tumor cell evolution is iterative or repetitive. Outputs from one generation become inputs for the next generation and further compound the chaos. Even a very simple, well-defined set of rules can give rise to totally chaotic and unpredictable results when the output from one cycle becomes the input for the next cycle. Minor differences in starting point can become magnified and after multiple cycles give output results that are completely different. No one has ever successfully predicted the pathways of tumor cell evolution and because the underlying processes are stochastic we can be confident that no one ever will. The bottom line is that cancer is an enormously diverse, unpredictable, stochastic evolutionary process.
about chronic myelogenous leukemia or CML? CML is not an exception. Its pathways of evolution are, un are unpredictable. CML is a cancer of bone marrow stem cells that causes patients to have very high white blood cell counts and often enormously enlarged spleens. The disease is almost always caused by specific genetic alterations that result in the formation of an abnormal chromosome called the Philadelphia chromosome. A piece of chromosome 9 is broken off and switched with a piece of chromosome 22. The net result is that an oncogene, BCR able, is formed. This oncogene codes for the production of a new protein that causes the cells to be cancerous. The disease responds initially very well to targeted drugs like Gleevec that inhibit BCR able. At the time of diagnosis, early stage CML has very little genetic heterogeneity or variation. The cancer cells are all very similar. This contrasts sharply with the genetic chaos that is present in most common types of cancer at diagnosis. In CML, the rate of evolution is initially very slow. The chronic phase typically lasts several years, during which time the disease is stable and undergoes little evolutionary change. However, over time, CML evolves into the acute phase, which can be rapidly progressive. New genetic alterations and mechanisms of cancer can arise that are independent of the original bcr able oncogene. When this happens, Gleevec and other drugs targeted to BCR able are no longer effective. This same theme has been observed over and over and over again in both human cancers and in oncogene-driven animal models. Cells with totally new genetic alterations independently evolve that can confer independence to the original oncogene and resistance to targeted drugs like Gleevec. Without exception, drug resistance has been observed to all drugs that target particular genetic alterations and particular pathways of tumor cell evolution. Drug resistance can and does arise by a huge number of different mechanisms and result in treatment failure. That's why modern targeted anti-cancer drugs typically prolong patient survival by only weeks to months, if at all. I do not mean to minimize the benefits that newer targeted drugs can provide to some patients. However, it is important to recognize the profound limitations of this approach. Resistance evolves and the therapies fail. If tumor cell evolution is unpredictable, then how is it possible to determine if a cancer will be aggressive or not? Aggressive cancers can be detected, not predicted. The examination of cancer cells from a patient can identify existing aggressive disease, but cannot enable one to predict if it will evolve from low-grade lesions. Aggressive cancers are characterized by a high rate of cell proliferation, a high degree of invasiveness, and a high degree of genetic and epigenetic instability in tumor cell heterogeneity. Biomarkers characteristic of these properties can provide a basis to identify patients that are at high risk of developing progressive disease. However, the absence of such indicators does not mean that the lesion will not develop into aggressive cancer. The stochastic nature of tumor cell evolution precludes the ability to accurately predict which early stage tumors will progress and which will remain harmless. Is it necessary to kill all tumor cells in a patient to cure cancer, potentially? No. It's important to recognize that not all tumor cells can sustain the disease of cancer. Nearly half of all tumor cells will die or fail to proliferate. Only those cells that can engage in malignant behavior, malignant cells, can sustain the disease of cancer and need to be killed to cure the disease. And not all tumor cells are cancer cells and malignant cells. And I would be using the term cancer cell and malignant cell interchangeably. To consistently cure cancer, every single malignant cell in the patient must be killed or inactivated, but not necessarily all tumor cells. Animal models have clearly shown 
that the transplantation of a single cancer cell can cause fatal disease. However, it's probably not necessary to actively kill every last cancer cell. Small colonies of cancer cells often spontaneously regress. However, it is important to recognize that a treatment that shrinks a tumor by even 99% will fail, as billions of cancer cells will remain and cause progressive disease. Are there any conditions that must be met to cure or control cancer? Yes, there are other conditions. Any process that consistently cure or control cancer must jointly satisfy three basic conditions. Comprehensiveness, specificity, and for lack of a better word, knowability. Comprehensiveness refers to the need to kill or control all malignant cells present in the patient. Specificity refers to the need to kill or control cancer cells without excessive toxicity to the patient. Specificity depends upon differences between cancer cells and normal cells. Knowability refers to the need to target properties that can be known or accurately predicted. Unknown, random, or unpredictable properties cannot be targeted. Unless these three conditions are jointly satisfied, cancer treatment will fail. It should be noted that these three basic conditions must be satisfied to achieve either the cure or the chronic control of cancer. Processes that lack comprehensiveness will act as selective pressures and redirect the flow of tumor cell evolution, but cannot cure or control cancer. It's like trying to stop the flow of a river with only half of a dam. Doesn't the immune system target unknown, essentially random features of bacteria, viruses, and cancer cells? And if so, wouldn't this contradict what you just said, that unknown random properties cannot be targeted? No, not at all. The immune system does not target random unknown properties. Let me explain. The immune system follows a complicated set of rules, which enables it to, within limits, distinguish self from non-self, and specifically destroy non-self. By non-self, I mean invaders like bacteria, viruses, and cancer cells. The properties the immune system targets are defined by these fixed rules and are non-random. The immune system also uses a fixed set of rules and mechanisms to kill abnormal cells like cancer cells. Within the constraints set by these fixed rules, the immune system uses evolutionary processes to generate a wide range of antibodies and immune receptors that enable it to specifically detect and target a nearly unlimited number of different foreign substances, including tumor antigens. The immune response against cancer in a patient can be viewed as a battle between two evolutionary processes, tumor cell evolution and the evolution of the immune response against the cancer cells. In the long run, cancer has the advantage. The immune system must play by a fixed set of rules. Cancer cells do not. Cancer cells can and do evolve that evade detection and or destruction by the immune system. A large number of different mechanisms have been described by which cancer cells can evade the immune system. The very existence of clinically significant cancer in a patient indicates that the immune system has lost the battle. The immune system excels at meeting the condition of specificity, but cannot satisfy the conditions of comprehensiveness and knowability. Consequently, the immune system becomes just another selective pressure that redirects the flow of tumor cell evolution. The immune system changes the course of tumor cell evolution in the body, but cannot generally cure or control the disease. In part three of this series, when we talk about the requirements for the cure or control of cancer, it will become clearer why 50 years of intensive efforts to cure or control cancer by manipulating the immune system have failed. The FDA has recently approved two drugs that mean manipulate the immune system for the treatment of cancer. Provenge for prostate cancer and your boy for melanoma. Is this at odds with what you just said? No. 
let's look at the data. Provenge is a dendritic cell-based form of immunotherapy for prostate cancer, a so-called cancer vaccine. In a large, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial of Provenge, half the patients treated with placebo died of their disease by 21.7 months versus 25.8 months for Provenge, a difference of 4.1 months. By 48 months, the death rate was identical in both groups, approximately 80%. And the cost of Provenge is $93,000. Uravoy is a drug that removes the breaks from the immune response. In a clinical trial of 676 patients with advanced melanoma, Uravoy prolonged survival 3.5 months. 13% of the patients treated with Uravoy had severe or fatal autoimmune reactions. The cost of Uravoy is $120,000. Provenz and Uravoy are just additional examples of a long list of failures of the immune system to cure or chronically control cancer. The data speaks for itself. What's wrong with giving drugs that kill or control most, but not all of the cancer cells, shrinking the tumors, and then when treatment fails, switching to different drugs? Can't we just keep repeating this process as needed to achieve chronic control? No, this approach does not work. It fails to address the fact that as cancer evolves, the genetic diversity becomes even greater the rate of tumor cell evolution accelerates, and the disease can progress ever more rapidly and fail to respond to the next round of drugs. The notion of chronic control is about chasing tumor cell evolution, which is a losing proposition. Partial solutions that lack comprehensiveness will fail. Unfortunately, most cancer research is focused on piecemeal attempts to solve a problem that requires attacking the whole. The sole exception is multiple drug combination chemotherapy, which was purposely developed to target all cancer cells in the patient and achieve comprehensiveness. It's not surprising that multiple drug combination chemotherapy is the only type of therapy that has proven capable of achieving high cure rates for at least some types of metastatic cancer. However, conventional multiple drug combination chemotherapy is not the answer because it fails to jointly satisfy the conditions of comprehensiveness, specificity, and knowability. What is the major scientific obstacle to satisfying these three conditions and curing or controlling the cancer? Tumor cell evolution fundamentally limits what can be known. First, we cannot know what has evolved unless we examine every single cancer cell in the patient at each point in time, which is generally not possible. As mentioned previously, a patient with cancer can have billions of different cancer cells spread throughout his or her body. Examining only a sample of cancer cells from the patient is totally inadequate. Second, we cannot know what will evolve. It is not possible to formulate a true scientific theory that can predict the unpredictable course of tumor cell evolution. Can you explain in more detail why examining a sample of a patient's cancer cells provides inadequate information for cure or control of cancer? First, there's no such thing as a representative sample of a patient's cancer cells. Every cancer cell is different. Second, there is no valid way to generalize experimental observations made on a sample or subset of cancer cells to the greater set of all cancer cells present in the patient. Any such generalizations would be based on induction, which is logically unsound. Nature does not respect or obey the false logic of induction. Can you give us some more concrete examples to address this problem and explain it? Sure. If you examine 10 million cancer cells and find them all to be sensitive to a drug, you cannot conclude that all cancer cells in the patient are drug sensitive. They almost certainly are not, and one drug-resistant cancer cell can become a big problem. A huge amount of experimental data 
has demonstrated major genetic differences within primary tumors, between a primary tumor and metastatic lesions, and between different metastatic lesions from the very same patient. It is common for genetically almost completely different cells to exist in different locations in one and the same patient. Dr. Chris Klein and his colleagues demonstrated that disseminated breast cancer cells often lack genetic alterations that are present in the primary tumor and often have completely different genetic alterations. In other words, there are parallel and divergent evolutionary pathways in a patient. Furthermore, tumor cell evolution can be marked by abrupt discontinuities that generate almost completely new cell types in a single step. The Sanger Research Institute recently published truly amazing gene sequencing results, which provide strong evidence that hundreds to thousands of new genetic alterations can arise in cancer cells during a single event. So, both as a matter of logic and as a practical matter, the analysis of a sample of cancer cells from a patient provides inadequate information to allow us to satisfy the condition of comprehensiveness. What we get is the illusion of knowledge. Are you saying that the problem of cancer cannot be solved by the experimental characterization of cancer cells? even the patient's own cancer cells? Yes. The situation is analogous to trying to understand and model the churning currents and eddies of the Colorado River as it roars through the Grand Canyon by studying a pail of river water. This is a really important point. Cancer is not about any particular cancer cells. Cancer is about a constantly changing enormously diverse, unpredictable, stochastically evolving population of malignant cells in a patient. Has scientific, uh, has science, sorry I'll start down over. Has science reached its limits when it comes to dealing with the nearly unlimited complexity of cancer? No, absolutely not. But, as currently defined, the problem of cancer is unsolvable. That's why we need a new way of thinking about cancer. It is time to re-examine the most basic assumptions that form the very foundations of modern cancer research. As I mentioned earlier, we need a higher level theory of cancer, based not on the properties of cancer cells, but based on properties of the set of all cancer cells that could evolve. This will be the major focus of part three in our series. Excellent. Thank you again, Dr. Glazer, for your time. Thank you. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to appear on the new Cancer Mentality webcast. So please join us for part two of the series in which Dr. Glazer will discuss the requirements for the prevention of cancer, and part three as well, in which Dr. Glazer will discuss the requirement for the cure or control of cancer.